So something exciting's just arrived in the post this morning. It's one of the samples that I mentioned in last week's vlog that was on its way to me. Hey, perfect. Look at that. A beautifully dehydrated mushroom. Thanks, Paul. Um, which is hopefully quite a rare species. What I'm going to do is I'm going to extract the DNA from it and then put it through our fungal DNA barcoding workflow and send it off for sequencing to confirm whether it is what we think it is. I noticed the weekend as I was walking past our neighbour's house that he's got some pretty cool mushrooms in his front garden. So it seems as I'm already going to be extracting the DNA from the dried mushroom that arrived in the post this morning. Um, I'm going to add a few more to the collection. Okay, so now I've collected the mushrooms and they've arrived in the post and whatnot. Uh, I'm going to show you how to extract the DNA from them using two different methods. The Hotshot DNA Extraction Kit, this one here, and the uh, Dipstick DNA Extraction Method. The reason I'm doing both of these side by side um, is because sometimes one extraction method might work better than the other. And basically the methods are so easy look that I just have them written on two post-it notes. And that's the whole start to finish of both extractions. So I've got my mushrooms here. Um, I'm going to call this one uh, Fungus 7. So it's a little brown one with um, a slightly sort of uh, shiny top to it. And then you can see the gills under there. Hopefully you can see that. Um, I'm gonna call the next little brown one, which is a smaller, less shiny version of that one, Fungus 8. It might be the same one. Uh, I am quite new to this fungal ID. Um, it looks different to me. So I'm gonna put it through and see what it comes out as. That one is fungus eight. This is the eight only fungus that I recognise from my neighbour's patch, uh, which is a shaggy ink cap. I think they look really cool, actually. Just got to make sure that I don't get any ink and rather just some fungus flesh. Ooh, and that is fungus nine. And then fungus 10 is the one that arrived in the post this morning that's already been dried nicely for me. Um, Lessinum albo stipitatum, right, apologies if that was completely wrong, I'm going to stick to fungus 10 from now on rather than say that again. <laughs> so what I've done is just made a note of those in my lab book because even though I think right now I'll never forget what I labelled each mushroom and which everyone, is, uh, like each sample is, uh, give me a week and I will not be able to tell you what that corresponds to. And I've also labelled my tubes here. So the ones um, with the D underneath are for the dipstick extraction method. The ones with the H underneath are for the hot shot. So in readiness for the dipstick extraction, I'm just going to add 100 microliters of the extraction buffer to each of the large tubes. Then I'm going to take um, fungus 8, actually, which is the smaller brown one. And then what I'm trying to do with my new and clean scalpel is to shave off the parts of the mushroom that have been exposed to the air, because that means um, they're more likely, those parts, sorry, are more likely to be um, contaminated with bacteria and fungi, other fungi. Whereas we only want to extract the DNA from this fungus. So this is probably going to be um, easier said than done, but I'm just going to cut off like a little section there and try and peel off the top. Oh, actually, no, that should be quite good. So what I want to go for is that middle section there because it's not likely to be contaminated. Ooh, let's see if I can do this really neatly on camera. Oh yes. Oh no, the gills are up 
came for quite too much. Oh, I was in bad actually. I'll take that. Yeah. Cool. So I'm just going to move that to the side. And then this is my kitchen pestle and mortar. So it's not dedicated to molecular biology. Last night I was using it to crush up peppercorns for dinner. So it's absolutely fine to use your kitchen pestle and mortar. Um, just give it a good old clean with fairy liquid. And then if you can, uh, use some disinfectant spray and just wash it out again. Just to make sure that uh, you're not contaminating it with DNA from pepper or anything else that you have just re used it to grind up. Then we're going to grind the mushroom up. The joy of working with mushrooms is that they grind up really easily into a pulp. So it really doesn't take much muscle to get that looking uh, pretty good to go. And nicely it comes out on the pestle. So I'm going to pop some of that in the liquid for the dipstick extraction. There you go. And then a little bit in. Okay. Much harder to get hold of this on a scalpel blade. So probably where it came up off the pestle. But there we go. That'll do enough there. So you're looking for between one and two cubic millimetres of tissue to go in the exit extractions. So that's actually more than enough. That's going to go in the tube there for the hot shot extraction. There we go. Right, so now uh, I'm going to wash and disinfect my pestle and mortar and move on to the next mushroom. All right, super. So I have the ground up mushrooms now in 100 microliters of extraction buffer for the dipstick method um, and just loosen the tube for the hot shot method. So now I just need to dilute the uh, samples in the extraction buffer for the dipstick by adding a further 400 microliters to each tube. And if you do this very carefully without actually touching the tube, you don't need to swap your pipettes. But if you um, don't have quite a steady hand, because I have been doing this for quite a few years and it's completely fine if uh, you can't not touch the tube, then just um, swap out your pipette tip after each time. Then I'm just gonna put the lid down, give that a little shake. Tap it down. Same again for all of those samples. So I'm now going to add 75 microliters of the outline lysis buffer to each of my samples going through the hot shot. And same as before, if you've got a steady hand and you can get away without touching your tip on the edge of the tube, then you can just use the same one. Um, because these PCR tubes are a lot smaller than the uh, microcentrifuge tubes that I was using for the dipstick. I'm just gonna be safe and uh, use a new tip each time. Lovely. Same again. Just gonna put the lids back on, give those a little shake in there, just to make sure that the um, tissue that I've put into the tube is fully submerged into that alkaline lysis buffer. Great. Okay, so the next step is to put the um, samples in the alkaline lysis buffer for the hotshot DNA extraction into the bento lab. So all I'm doing here is just switching my bento lab on. And whilst that gets ready, I'm just going to transfer my four samples into the heat block. Good, excellent. And whilst that's doing, we'll just finish off the dipstick. DNA extractions. Hopefully you can hear me okay over the sound of the Bento Lab heat block. Um, so whilst the samples for the hot shock DNA extraction are on the heat block, I'm going to finish off the dipstick DNA extraction. 
So I have the samples, there we go, in the extraction buffer. Now I'm going to add to fresh tubes one mil or 100 microliters of the wash buffer. Then for each sample, I'm going to take a fresh dipstick out of the glass bottle. And take the sample in the extraction buffer and then I'm going to dip that dipstick in three times nice and slowly making sure that it's mixed around in the sample so one two and just smush it into the bottom and three so essentially if you think here of the loose DNA from your sample now floating around in the extraction buffer you're trying to capture it all on your little dipstick and then I want to elute that into the wash buffer by dipping the dipstick in five times and you just like moving it around to transfer that DNA from the dipstick into your wash buffer so that's two three four, five. And it's as easy as that. You should now have DNA in your wash buffer, which is ready to use in your PCR. So I'm gonna do that again for the next three mushrooms samples and uh, then come back to you for the next bit. Right, so the samples for the hot shot extraction kit um, have been on the heat block for 20 minutes now they're just cooling so I'm going to take them off move them onto my rack so they can carry on cooling down away from the heat block and then just make sure that you can hear me alright I'm going to Leave that running because it needs to cool down. So hopefully you can hear me okay over the sound of that heat block cooling. So now I have the sample in the alkaline lysis buffer, which has been um, broken down essentially with the heating step. And I need to neutralize the alkali with a neutralizing buffer. So I'm gonna go back into the hot shot kit And take out the neutralizing buffer and I'm going to add 75 microliters of neutralizing buffer to each of the samples now there we go. and you just give that a mix so that it is definitely um, neutralizing the alkali you can just turn it upside down a few times just so that you can see the liquid mixing. Oh, that's nicer, isn't it? That's quieter. There you go. Put it back in there. Back in there. And there we have the four mushroom samples that I showed you at the beginning uh, in the wash buffer from the dipstick method. And also the four samples extracted by the hotshot method. So all of these are now good to go uh, into the fridge if you're going to carry on with your PCR straight away, or you can put them in the freezer and defrost them whenever you're ready to do the PCR. Smithy found that all so fascinating. He's even come up to have a look at what was going on. Morning. Today it's time to do the PCR on the DNA extractions that I did yesterday. This tube contains the master mix for the PCR, 
it has the fire pole in um, the right amount of PCR grade water and the fungal barcoding primer mix. Uh, next up, I'm going to transfer this master mix to the individual tubes um, and then I'll come back to you. Now I have my PCR tubes all filled with the master mix and labelled with the names of the samples I extracted DNA from yesterday. You also want to fill one more tube with master mix than you have the number of samples because that's going to be your negative control. So you're not going to put any DNA in that tube, you're just going to leave it master mix only, put it through the PCR and make sure that your master mix isn't contaminated in any way. For the next step, I have taken the DNA extractions from yesterday out of the fridge given them a good vortex. Then I've transferred um, four microliters of each DNA extraction into my PCR tubes containing the master mix. Then on the Bento Lab, I've set up the fungal barcoding PCR program. And then I'm just going to transfer those PCR tubes onto the PCR um, block in the Bento Lab and set that PCR running. It's now two hours since I set the PCR running, so I'm going to transfer the product from the tubes, PCR tubes, into this gel that I prepared whilst the PCR was running. So I've loaded my samples onto the gel, and you can just see the bubbles where the current's running down through the gel tank. So that's got 30 minutes left to run for. And then for the next bit, which is the most exciting bit, is the results. Okay, now for the moment of truth. All I've done is unplug the gel tank from the Bento Lab and remove the lid from the gel tank. So now I'm just going to pop the tank onto the blue light transilluminator, put the box over and switch the blue light on and we'll be able to see whether our PCR has worked. Oh, there's a band, look, there's a band. Oh, cool. Okay, amazing. Right, well, um, I have forgotten to add the DNA ladder. Whoops, I've never <laughs> done that before. So apologies, that was probably because I was filming. Um, so that's a shame because we can't actually tell what size those bands are. However, uh, the rest of the gel is pretty good. The last column is the negative control and there's no band in that. So that's very good. Um, and then uh, I loaded it such that the each sample was in pairs. So the first is the hotshot DNA extraction and the second is the dipstick extraction. So it actually looks for um, this that both extraction methods have worked for fungi 7, the dipsticks worked for fungi 8. There's a bit of a difference in the size of the amplicons there for fungi 9 um, and then only the dipstick has worked for fungi 10 which is the one we're particularly interested in because that's the um, dried and rare specimen. Uh, there's quite a lot of primer dimer, but that's just a case of optimising this PCR because uh, I figured I'd do it for the first time with you on camera. Uh, so not a bad first try, apart from having forgotten the DNA ladder. Okay, I realised I said at the beginning of this vlog that I was going to extract the DNA from those mushrooms and then uh, put them through the PCR and send them off for sequencing so we could find out what they are. Um, but I've realised that the sequencing part of it is not going to fit into the timescale of this week's vlog. So I'm going to propose a part two whereby I show you how uh, to set everything up to send it off for sequencing and then show you like getting the results back from the facility and processing them. Um, so in that case, stay tuned for part two of this vlog where we find out what the fungi were that we extracted the DNA from in this one. Uh, in which case, please follow the Bento Lab on Twitter or subscribe to our YouTube channel.